David, I'll kind of leave it to you when you want to start. I can see people are starting to log in. Welcome. We're going to wait one more minute uh, before we officially begin. Thank you for joining us this morning from wherever it is you're joining us from. By all means, uh, please put in the chat function uh, who you are and where you're joining us from this morning so we have an idea about who's in our audience. Welcome, Doug. Danny from Singapore, fantastic. Karen from British Karen Columbia. Mato. You're, yeah, your former grad student, that's right. Yes, hello, Karen. So Kendra. Nice to see you join us. Postdoc from the beautiful Okanagan. Oh, Mary did make, make it this morning. Hi, Mary. <laughs> this is fantastic. Oh, and Ted's here too, good, awesome. David, Greg, I haven't spoken to you in ages. Great to see your name. Well, let's get started. Uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. This is, Eli you know, I were just chatting before we got on. We think this is our eighth uh, Stedward talk. And these started a couple of years ago. My name is David Legg and I'm the volunteer president of what's called IFAPA, the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity. And I was a PhD student of Dr. Stedwards, whom the Stedward talks are named after. So I was a PhD student of his at the University of Alberta, and I'm grateful that he allowed me to pass. Um, and so I, you know, I, I owe him that. And so that's, you know, in part why we've named these talks after him is my eternal gratitude for allowing me to actually graduate uh, from my program. So thank you, Dr. Stedward. For that. Uh, Eli Wolf is the other moderator, the, the co-founder and co-moderator of this event, and Eli is with Disability in Sport, which has been in existence, we decided, for over 20 years, um, from its uh, beginnings at Northeastern University in Boston. Eli is also an academic affiliated with a number of universities, including UConn uh, and Brown University um, on the East Coast of the United States. So the purpose of these Stedward talks is uh, we initiated them because we recognized that there were a number of untold stories as it related to the Paralympic movement, um, and in particular as it related to inclusion. And so, you know, to, to steal Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history phrase, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, a good Canadian, I always have to throw that in. Um, what we're trying to do is look to the past to understand the future. And so our very first Edward talk was with Dr. Stedward talking about the origins of the International Paralympic Movement, and he was the founding president uh, starting in 1989. We've looked at specific sports, including para ice hockey, sledge hockey. Um, we looked at uh, what we referred to as the classification system within Nordic skiing, but of course it's not the classification system, it's the, the, the way that athletes were uh, attributed to different events, and, and Dr. Ted Fay, who's listening in today, helped lead us on that. But today what we decided to focus on was uh, the influence of medicine, and in particular sport medicine, on the Paralympic movement. So we have three awesome speakers who know each other quite well that I've only gotten to understand recently, and so this may be a challenge for me as a moderator. Um, I'm going to admit to that at the outset and trying to, to keep the three of them from uh, just basically mocking each other the entire uh, <laughs> remainder of this session. We did have a fourth speaker, and unfortunately, Chelsea Cattell had to step away at the last minute, so she sends her sincere regrets and apologies for not being able to join us. But if I may, um, I just want to spend a little bit of time introducing our speakers, and then we're going to get right to it. And then, you know, through the chat function, and certainly if, if I, if you're willing to, I would be happy to have you ask your questions directly um, and verbally. I will say one of our speakers, Stuart, who is not on screen right now, is actually working today, um, and so may have to step away and may step back and forth from his responsibilities. Uh, as far as work goes. So Stuart may come and come out uh, from our presentation, but let me let me get to our speakers, uh, if I may. Eli, is there anything that I missed um, in your introductory comments? 
No, no, thank you so much. This is really looking forward to this conversation. And of course, having, you know, Dr. Studward to share some of those remarks as well. Um, no, back to you, David. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, first and foremost, let me introduce um, Sherry Blowett, who's, who's married to Eli. So that's how we were able to corner her uh, into agreeing to do this. We really had to, to really up the sales pitch. Um, in order A lot of bribery, bribery at home. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, Sherry Blout is an assistant professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School. Perhaps you've heard of it, uh, Harvard. Uh, yeah, I think a few people have heard of that as an institution. Um, she's the attending physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. She serves as the director of the Kelly Adaptive Sports Research Institute. Dr. Blout is also a former Paralympic athlete, as is Eli. Um, Sherry was an athlete in the sport of wheelchair racing, competing for the United States in three Paralympic Games, including Sydney in 2000, Athens 2004, and Beijing in 2008. And she's brought home a total of seven Paralympic medals. She's also a two-time winner of both the Boston and New York City Marathon. So thank you, Sherry, for joining us this morning. Well, or this afternoon, or this evening. I look forward to it. Where you are. Um, our second speaker is uh, Wayne Derman, uh, who's the director and chair of the Institute of Sport and Exercise Medicine at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And he's joining us this morning from his home in Cape Town. He's also director of the FIFA Medical Center of Excellence and co-director of the South African IOC Research Center for Injury Prevention and the Protection of Health of the Athlete. Our third speaker, um, and again, he may you know, be coming in and coming out depending on his responsibilities at work right now, is Stuart Willock who's a sport medicine physician. Oh, there he is. He is joining us by video briefly. Uh, since 1999, he has been a team physician for the United States Ski and Snowboard Association, the U.S. Speed Skating Team, and the U.S. Bobsled and Skeleton Team. He also serves as medical officer uh, of the International Paralympic Committee and has attended every Olympic and Paralympic Games since Sydney 2000, which is, of course, where Sherry won her first medal uh, as a Paralympic athlete. Thank you to our three speakers for joining us this morning. Now, before we get to your comments as it relates to the intersection and the history of sport medicine and the Paralympic Movement, we wanted to ask Dr. Stedward uh, to provide his thoughts and um, kind of wisdom as it relates to the Paralympic Movement and the intersection of sport medicine. Of course, Dr. Stedward's uh, intersection with Paralympic sport goes back prior to his becoming the founding president in 1989. I believe it goes back to the 1920s. Um, when Dr. Stedward was first involved in the Paralympic movement. Did you even, did you even acknowledge that joke there, or are you just not even paying attention to me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, try, I try, I try. Dr. Stedward, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, certainly a, a, a very special welcome to our three guests, particularly with Sherry and Wayne and Stuart. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what they have to say with regards to sport medicine involvement within the Paralympics, particularly uh, in, in more recent years. I want to try to give <clears throat> a little bit of background to set the stage as to the involvement of uh, medicine and sport with the Paralympics. And if I may be so bold as to draw a line in the sand uh, in the year 1988, uh, because from my uh, personal point of view, after spending and living more than 50 years of my life in the Paralympic movement, uh, I recognize that the 1988 Paralympic Games in Seoul, South Korea was the beginning of the modern Paralympic Games. If you look prior to that, uh, in the uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s, uh, most of the sport training and friendly competition and re and and, and uh, recreation took place in hospitals and in rehab centers. And most of the activities were conducted and provided by the doctors, the nurses, the orderlies, the PTs, the OTs, and a scattering of parents who, who were volunteers, uh, usually for their spouses or sons and daughters. So 
we didn't really have any sort of a um, sport medicine involvement in those early days. Uh, in fact, in more in the 60s, uh, we only had uh, uh, spinal cord injured individuals using wheelchairs to participate in sport. And of course, if you think back then, the only wheelchairs that they had were the wheelchairs that there were given to them by by the hospital or by companies that had simple chairs to get them from A to B and most of them didn't fit anyone anyway. Um, and when we started to evolve out of the uh, hospitals and more into the community, we had to have some system of dividing the uh, the athletes into categories. So we created an anatomical metal, uh, medical model, simple as that. And that was uh, used for many years. In fact, I remember on <clears throat> more than one occasion having some uh, uh, very intense arguments with the former or with the past uh, 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 Sir Ludwig Gutmann uh, with regards to his interests and vision in medicine and sport and in the classification system. Then we move into sort of the 70s and things started to change uh, because we started to see more organizations evolve from different disabilities, cerebral palsy, mentally handicapped, amputees, visually impaired, and the like. Where do they fit into all of this? And so we started to have to look at uh, current and future Paralympic Games and how do we start looking at the existing classifications? Because it was simply an anatomical metal model. Uh, there was nothing fancy about it. Uh, our athletes weren't as sophisticated in those days, weren't as well trained because we didn't have professional coaches to help as well. We weren't integrated into the community of sport medicine or into any of the national and international sport federations. And we didn't have our first uh, Paralympic Games for multi-disabilities until 1976 in Toronto. And at that time and prior, to, well, prior to that time, prior to the 1980s, uh, with the exception of, you know, a very, very minimal involvement of the Paralympic Games in 60 and 64, they were all in rehab centers. Uh, they weren't even at Olympic sites. They weren't in an Olympic village. They weren't using uh, Olympic facilities. So how could we expect to have a lot of sport medicine involvement? But then in the 80s, and this is where now I'm going to turn it over to Sherry and Wayne and Stuart, is that in the 80s, things started to change. First of all, uh, a, a sports scientist by the name of Horst Strokendahl uh, brought forward a functional classification system for wheelchair basketball. It's very well documented. He did some of the original work back in, I remember being with him in that classification system back in 1982. So uh, in discussing with Horace and with other people, I said, you know, if we're going to move forward with functional systems, we're now going to have to have different disabilities integrating as well. So perhaps we better look at changing the structure and governance of sport for athletes living with a disability. So that's what I stuck my neck out and started circulating proposals around the world to it ever listen, which brought about the Arnhem Seminar in 1987, where we accepted a number of changes that set really the springboard for sport medicine to get involved. We wanted a change. We wanted to reduce the number of classes. We wanted to change the classes to a functional system, not a medical anatomical system. Um, we know we had to structure by sport, not disability. We wanted to find some way of integrating and being included within the Olympic model and the International Federation model so we could work with their uh, sport medicine docs and whether it be the classification or drug testing and the likes. 
So that's why I say 88 was so crucial because in 88, when Seoul had the games with the same committee in the same facilities as the Olympic games, that was the springboard where we then continue that for the rest of our lives to this current date. And of course, we saw professional coaches starting in, in the Seoul and uh, we had a lot more started to have drug testing. We started to looking at world-class facilities. Our athletes now were really uh, beginning to be called athletes and not patients. So it was changing. And, uh, and I think what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll stop there because uh, this is a great place to springboard and have uh, Sherry and Wayne and Stuart uh, bring us up to the, uh, the modern times and tell us like it uh, really is now. So thank you very much for your, for your time, everyone. And now I'll sit back and, and, and uh, listen. Thank you, Dr. Stedward. As always, I enjoy uh, listening to you talk about, you know, examples of you and horse stroke and all, you know, figuring out the cloud, like I just like the name dropping. I, I love hearing the stories. And again, it's all it's all up there. Stuart, I don't know if you're able to join us. So I'm I'm caught. I'm conscious of your inability, perhaps to speak later in the session. So if you're available right now, I'll offer you the opportunity to speak. Um, and if I don't see your face on the screen, then I'll assume that you're not there. Um, but what I'm wanting our speakers to do now, so Dr. Sedward has taken us up to what he referred to as this, the birth of the modern Paralympic Games, so 1988. And so, of course, the, the summer games were in Seoul. The winter games were not in Calgary. The winter Olympics were in Calgary, but that was before the, the pattern of hosting Olympic and Paralympic Games in the same cities began. And so I, I'm hoping that the three speakers can talk a little bit about, and I realize it's a bit of a jump from 88 to perhaps kind of the late 1990s and early 2000s when many of you started to get involved. But what I'm wanting, perhaps, is to get that connection of the history of sport medicine and Paralympic sport, and perhaps, again, reflecting on your past, so for the last 20 years, in some cases, 2025, what have been some of the major themes and issues um, of that intersection of sport medicine and Paralympic sports? So, Stuart, I'll give you the first opportunity, but again, if I don't see your space in the next two seconds, I'm going to pass it off. All right, so Stuart may have stepped out. Wayne or Sherry, can I ask either of the two of you to, to volunteer to go first? I'm Sherry, sorry. I saw your mute button go off first. So. <laughs> I had a feeling Wayne, Wayne would pass it on. So no, I'm happy to start. Um, and, you know, and I acknowledge that my, um, if we left off at 1988, you know, my perspective and ability to comment from a sports medicine lens leaves a bit of a gap. So maybe we can circle back with Stuart on that because he has definitely been involved um, from a sports medicine perspective for much longer than me because uh, in 1988 I was eight years old and I didn't even know what the Paralympics were and I certainly was not practicing medicine thank goodness yet at that time um, but you know you know thankfully over the next several years I had the opportunity to get involved in more community-based adaptive sport and then continue to grow as an athlete and bridge that into um, a career as a Paralympic athlete and representing the U.S. Um, what I would say, I, I can touch upon a couple of themes and then turn it over to Wayne. Um, I'd say that what, what I think is interesting about your comments, Dr. Stedward, is, you know, hearing about um, how in the early part of the movement, it was all blended together, right? Like we wanted to get people with disabilities involved in sport and enable there to be a pipeline toward elite competition. And when we thought about sports medicine, it was all intertwined with rehabilitation aspects and classification aspects. And it was sort of one, it seems as though it was sort of one big jumble of work. Um, and what we really see now is um, we've seen these different streams of work really differentiate themselves in a really positive and I think empowering way. Um, so now, you know, at the level of involvement where myself and Wayne and Stuart work, we really are talking about sports medicine, right? Um, and actually, we're not talking that much about classification because we're able to differentiate, you know, what what is you know classification as being a system that helps to, you know, create fairness in Paralympic sport and categorize athletes according to a standard set of rules, you know, international harmonization, fair play, all of that. But then we're able to actually 
you know, with an understanding that that's set and there's really smart, great people working on that, we're able to really pivot and talk about sports medicine in its more classic sense, you know, promoting athlete health um, and thinking about injury prevention and ensuring that as our athletes develop their careers as in para sport and maybe eventually reach the Paralympics, that they um, have opportunities to interface and work with clinicians who understand their experience and their health risks, um, you know, as a, as a high level athlete with a disability. So, um, so really the two fields have sort of, have sort of, I think, differentiated themselves, but I think that's just symbolic of the overall growth of the movement. Um, and now, and, and I'd say where we're at now, you know, looking at Paralympic sport medicine is really, you know, seeing, seeing the evolution of what we're doing really mirroring the growth of the movement more broadly. So, you know, as more people become aware of Paralympic sport, as there's ever increasing recognition of the eliteness of Paralympic athletes, we see people from the general sports medicine sector, like really raising their hand and wanting to get involved, which is fantastic. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot more collaboration, I think, at the, at the country level between people involved in sports medicine for the, under the umbrella of their NOC versus their NPC. Um, and sometimes a blurring of those lines, which, you know, I know overall is a good thing. Um, for example, a physician who may, Wayne can speak to this, this is what happened to him, a physician who may be working with their Olympic team, who then gets tapped on the shoulder to work with their Paralympic team. And, you know, we're, we're uh, seeing an excitement about that, about sports medicine clinicians wanting to work with both Olympic and Paralympic athletes and understanding that they may need to upskill a little bit um, to really uh, understand the nuances of athlete health in the Paralympic athlete and how you need to care for the athlete and pro provide the highest standard of sports medicine care. So I'd say that's, that's one really interesting evolution. Um, the other is we've, we've definitely seen an evolution and a growth of collaboration at the international level between everything that's happening at the IOC and then what we're able to do at the IPC, such that when a topic in sports medicine is elevated as a high priority topic, uh, for example, something like athlete mental health, that um, we, we move that, that, that priority forward, more and more so we move it forward together. So we think about, you know, what do we need to do in terms of you know, international consensus statements or white papers or systematic reviews that look at both Olympic and Paralympic athletes. Um, and how do we then create knowledge translation um, activities? Uh, how do we stimulate research that continues to elevate that sports medicine priority topic, but for both, uh, for both movements? Um, and, you know, we, I think we're really there now, you know, there, there's always more work to do, but we have really fantastic and deep relationships between leaders who are really driving that work within the Olympic movement as well as within the Paralympic movement and then some who are doing both. <laughs> um, and so I think that's also a really important area of progress that's evolved, I'd say really only over the last 10 years or so. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there just because that was a lot. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, discuss a little bit or turn it over to Wayne. Back to you, David. Yeah, let's... <laughs> Yeah, so Stuart, again, I'm assuming that you're not available yet, so we'll go to Wayne. And before Wayne gets on his third glass of wine as well, I think it's important that we get <laughs> um, But I do want to come back, Sherry, to your talk, to, you know, you mentioned about the intersection between the IOC and the IPC, the Olympic and the Paralympic. The, and, you know, as an example, here, I, it was funny, I'm wearing my Canadian Paralympic Committee jacket, and of course, in the United States, it's now one organization, the USOPC, if I think I have the acronym right. Um, and so that, that kind of connecting of the Olympic and Paralympic worlds. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time coming back to that if we can, as it relates to sport medicine and mm -hmm. perhaps the pros and cons of that, mm -hmm. of that intersection. But let's, let me, let me go down to Wayne. Um, and again, it's seven o'clock in the morning in Cape Town. So again, he's already on a second glass of wine. So we don't want to keep him waiting uh, too long. Seven, 7 p.m. David. 7 <laughs> p.m. <Sorry. laughs> yeah, otherwise I would really be worried about myself drinking my wine here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, listening to Sherry and, and, and uh, Sherry brought you in at um, the level of her being an athlete and then the physician. Um, I, I think of my own uh, story in the Paralympic movement and how I got there. And uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting, and, and I always tell Sherry, Sherry that um, 
my path there was not without a great deal of my own resistance to it. Um, because in 2000, I was appointed the chief medical officer for the South African Olympic team and worked with our Olympic athletes very closely to, at that stage, evolve sports medicine here in South Africa, which was a couple of steps behind that in, in, in the global north. Um, I was reappointed uh, chief medical officer for the, the Athens 2004 Olympic Games, and there was no reason why I shouldn't have been uh, medical officer, chief medical officer, um, in uh, Beijing in 2008, because I was still very young, um, and had accumulated a, a, a lot of experience in that field. Well, 2007, I got a, um, a memo from the uh, Combined Olympic and Paralympic um, Committee saying, Dear Dr. Derman, we hereby wish to inform you that you have been given the job of the medical officer for the Paralympic team. And I said to them, listen, guys, you've made a typographical error here. It's meant to be the Olympic team. And they said, no, it's the Paralympic team. And I said, thank you. You've got the wrong guy for the job. And uh, I'm actually not interested. And it, 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 I had to do a lot of introspection and a lot of convincing to take my place in that team. And I remember that when I stood in Beijing with the South African flag behind us with the rest of the team, actually thinking, oh my word, here I am, I'm the team physician. I've got a guy standing next to me who doesn't have a leg. I've got a guy in front of me who's in a chair. I've got another guy here next to me who can't see anything. How on earth am I as a physician going to be able to deal with all these people? And I was literally thrown in the deep end to have to deal with that. And I realized that the sports medicine training does not equip you for this. And Sherry spoke about upskilling. Well, let me tell you that what I learned is that you get sports medicine and why a physician is drawn into sports medicine, I think, and certainly this was the case with myself, is because you are scared to let a part of medicine go. You want to do it all. You want to be able to treat the orthopedic injury and you want to be able to treat a person who has a myocardial infarction that is going to be rehabilitated through exercise. And you want to car carry that whole scope. You want to do pediatrics. So you want to do the, the young sports person. And you want to do geriatrics. You want to do the older sports person. What is it about sports medicine? It is the apex of human performance. It deals with the medicine, with the human being functioning the best that they can under their circumstances, whether they are diseased or whether they are in the prime of their physical condition. And what I learned is that working with Paralympic athletes, you get this layer of complexity over all of that. It is the highest challenge that you can have in the realm of sports medicine of getting peak performances with a layer of complexity of existing medical conditions and getting that person to perform at the highest level. And that bit me. That bit me, and I went to the, the literature, that was 2008, and while Sherry was busy talking, I was doing a PubMed search on the other computer here. And Dr. Stedward said that in 1988, well, you go back to 1988, and you put Paralympic in there, there's not one paper, not one paper in PubMed. And the first article we start getting is in 1999, you start seeing one. And then this goes through 2000, 2002, 2010, there are two, 2012, eight, 2015, nine. We peaked in 2018 with 20 PubMed publications. And then it's gone, unfortunately, I didn't realize this until I've done this. It's gone down a little bit. It's gone to 13, 20, 2019, and 10 in 2020. So you talk about the Paralympics being a new organization. 
Well, within the body of research that looks at Paralympic sports medicine, it is brand new. There are 100 papers out there. So that brings with it absolutely remarkable opportunity. And in my journey, and we are speaking about the intersection between the IOC and the IPC, in about 2010, we became an IOC research center of excellence. There were one of eight research centers at that time around the world. At that stage, I was at the University of Cape Town and Martin Schwellness and myself headed up the IOC research center there. And I remember going to the IOC and saying, listen, we would like to actually spend some of our research funding on Paralympic research. What do you think? And actually, they were more than keen for us to do that. And that's been, now we are still an IOC research center. There are now 12 around the world. I think a 13th one was added last year. And this is the area that we have identified that we want to contribute to with respect to research because there's this huge opportunity. If you go and have a look and you want to contribute to the area of concussion in sport, everybody's doing concussion okay there's a it's it's packed but actually there's a huge gap in the knowledge of parasport concussion and that's just the most remarkable thing david that we can contribute in this way and grow the field so bob this is a wonderful thing that we are so new and uh it's it's exciting it's exciting because of the fact we can really contribute. Mm -hmm. Let me just pause there, David, and reflect it back to you. Yeah, Th yeah, thank you, Wayne. I, so I do want, I want to continue this conversation of kind of where you started. And I, it's funny, I think back to my first Paralympic Games as an administrator were 1996 in Atlanta with Dr. Sedward, I was an assistant to him. I seem to recall, you know, autonomic dyslexia not being talked about in medical journals or in a more scientific way. I think it was in the National Enquirer um you know the the way that it was being presented uh and you know really trying to dram, you know dramatize uh the issue so I, I do think we've come a long way at intersection though you know such as yourself you know wayne from the from the able-bodied sector and now becoming in you know immersed in the paralympic movement are there any cons to this merger of the ioc and the ipc and thinking as it relates to uh, sport medicine and athletes with a disability. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily fishing for you know. You know that I'm, I'm trying to you know, kind of put you paint you in a corner. But it's. It, I would suspect, anyways, that there are lots of positives. Um, that there are lots of benefits to it. But are there any cons? Are there any potential pitfalls that we should kind of be acknowledging or aware of as we you know we and I say we the royal we the Paralympic movement, the Olympic movements continue to gravitate perhaps closer together. And again, the, the one instance that I talked about was the merger of the US OPC. Now, again, it hasn't happened in Canada, but to my knowledge, I think there's five other countries internationally where they have merged the NOC and the NPC. We're seeing it certainly in a sport medicine perspective that you've spoken to, but are there any cons to that? Is there anything that we need to kind of perhaps acknowledge or be aware of as we continue this well, sir. relationship? But also just in terms of the universal design aspects that, you know, perhaps this is actually both are there challenges, but also the opportunities, you know, the universal design elements of this as well. Yeah. And again, if I could remind just before we, we hear from the two of you, again, to those that are listening in, by all means, start putting any questions or comments that you wish to, to engage in, um, in the chat function. And we'll try and get to those as soon as we can. Well, uh, David, I think just to to uh, kick off, I, I'm not I'm not overtly aware of of the downsides of the of the the combination with the IOC. Um, I'm I'm trying to think. I, I also I'm so embedded in both organisations um, that maybe I can't see it. Um, <laughs> look, I I don't think that the closeness of the IOC or IPC, or let me rather say that the, the, the enthusiasm 
for the Paralympic side is not embodied by all enthusiasts of the IOC and uh, the Olympic Games. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I guess, I guess is there a possibility then of it losing prominence um, or uh, I'm not really, I, like losing its, its history perhaps, its traditions? Is, it, is there, a, is there a, a possibility of it just being engulfed and swallowed up by the larger uh, able-bodied sports system and that perhaps the, you know, the, the, the focus on Paralympic athletes actually gets lost as a result of this connection? Uh, okay. yeah. I, can, I, 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 I don't think so, David. And I, the reason I don't think so is that we've developed strong leadership in the field. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, to actually get on the IOC advanced team physician course, an entire module on the Paralympic athlete was hard work. We achieved it. Yes, we got bounced off. But the fact is, is that we will get back onto that program. They don't see it yet as, as important as the hamstring or, uh, yeah, okay, I'm being funny. But ankle sprains, the, ankle sprains. Yeah, <laughs> an, ankle sprains. I mean, you know, we, we've, got our, we've got our standard speak about this, this issue. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, but the thing is, is that it has been there. It wasn't part of the program. It is now part of the program. We have strong leadership. We have to fight to keep it there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I, I don't see a uh, overt threat to it. Sherry, I don't know if you feel differently. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question, David. I on the whole agree with Wayne. I think the only caution is that as we move forward, as it relates to the realm of medicine and sport medicine, that we continue to elevate and include individuals and clinicians with a rehabilitation background, because the reality is that we're strongest when we have that multidisciplinary team and we're able to have, um, you know, someone at the table uh, who may have 30 years of clinical experience in sport medicine and caring for the elite athlete, but also with the input and um, intersection with a spinal cord injury physician or a prosthetist, or um, a, a physio who is the world's expert in treating individuals with cerebral palsy. Because, because the, our greatest strength when we're at our most excellent is where we're, when we're able to bring those perspectives together. And I think the only risk is ensuring that clinicians who come from the rehabilitation sector don't get left behind or left out of the conversation. So, so that's interesting, Sherry, because so, so you're still talking about the value and the importance from the rehabilitation side, which is very much the roots of the mm -hmm. Paralympic movement, and that it's still, so the pen, we don't want the pendulum to swing so far where we forget or you ignore can't. that side of things. Yeah. You really can't, you really can't, because the reality is that, um, so yes, you know, para sport, Paralympic sport is recognized as elite sport, and um, and yes, it has a underpinning in, in rehabilitation and evolved out of rehabilitation. But the reality is that most people acquire their disability. I mean, there are certainly some, so some, some individuals have uh, developmental disability or are born with a disability of some type. Many of our athletes acquire their disability in, in adulthood. And um, every single one of those individuals goes through a rehabilitation process of some type, um, whether it's a long period or a short period, whether it's a fairly straightforward injury and it's brief or where they have a, you know, a more severe neuromuscular uh, type of injury that requires intensive rehab. And we still have a, we, we still have a role to play in ensuring that, that individuals as they're moving through the rehabilitation process are made aware of that goal of sport and, you know, what they can aspire to. So there's still that, I still think that, um, that spectrum where we, again, we really need, we're at our strongest when we have everyone involved, both rehab and mainstream sport medicine. And sometimes there's, a lab, right? Like Stuart and I are both rehabilitation physicians who specialize in sport medicine. So, you know, that's obviously, I think a, a great, um, you know, having both perspectives has been, I, I think, very valuable. I know for me. Now I see, Stuart, you've returned. Here we have Stuart. Um, 
that, that's just your avatar. I'm not 100 percent sure. So if you've returned <laughs> to us, I, I, I'm going to try and bring you up to speed really quick because I do want to get your input uh, and your comments again. Perhaps before you may have to be called away again. Um, so Dr. Sedward talked about the kind of the history of the intersection of medicine, sport medicine, and the Paralympic movement, and then. And then Sherry and Wayne were talking about kind of the current day up until the current day, so you know, the last 10 to 15 to 20 years um, as it relates to that intersection. I'm wondering if, Stuart, if I can just get you, and I know you, you don't benefit from having, having heard the other comments or conversations, but if you can just very quickly talk a little bit about kind of your own background and what you see as the intersection of sport medicine and the Paralympic movement. And I think, you know, in the bio, if I recall correctly, I think you've attended every Olympic and Paralympic game since 2000. So you certainly have a uh, a breadth of experience and thank you again for joining us from the ski hill in utah uh it's it's great to have you back you're on mute thank you professor lake thank you professor stedward for having me i apologize to you i apologize to my co-panelists i apologize to the audience uh for not being able not being present at the first half hour or so um, first of all, let me clarify, I've not attended every uh, Olympics and Paralympics, um, but uh, uh, several of them, certainly. And I think there are a few interesting things. I cover um, a lot of able-bodied sport, and I cover parasport. And, you know, 90, 95, 98% is the same for able-bodied sport and parasport. And then there are a few things that are different. Um, medicine is very, very important in sports because athletes have the typical injuries everybody else in the world has and illnesses, plus they have uh, sports injuries that impact their livelihood, impact their training, impact their competition, impact their psychological outlook and their day-to-day -day function. But in my experience, injuries in the para-athlete can potentially have uh, more ramifications than injury in the able-bodied athlete. And so many examples come to mind, but I can give you a few. Um, in, uh, I remember seeing an um, elite uh, high jumper uh, who had a lower limb deficiency on one side and walked and competed with a prosthesis, and he tore his Achilles tendon on his intact side. And unlike uh, somebody like myself, where, you know, we would go into a boot and walk around on crutches for a few months, it really had far more implications for uh, that particular individual not having a fully intact side on the other side. And then the other thing I worry about a lot, particularly in the para-athlete, along the same lines are the long-term effects of injury that occur during sport. So if you take that same example, a high jumper with a lower limb deficiency, uh, he's really loading his joints, for example, his hips and knees, um, day in, day out during training and competition. And when he's uh, 60, is he going to have advanced arthritis in his good hip and knee on the side, of the, on the intact side? Uh, so these are important questions for uh, para sport medicine and the International Paralympic Committee and the brilliant uh, injury surveillance system they've put into place is a great starting point to look not just at the injuries that occur during uh, major games, but also to start creating a longer term database to follow athletes um, into their 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond to see what are the uh, downstream implications of sports participation, and how can we decrease or prevent deleterious long-term musculoskeletal problems in these athletes so they can keep moving into their older, uh, later years. Thank you, and it's great to see you, and thank you for coming back and joining us. Um, I'm just, I'm paying attention to the chat function here, and I, I saw the, the comment from Nancy, um, as it related to athletes with greatest impairment, I, I recognize the, the comment from David Gregg in Spokane, Washington about you know, the importance of leadership and vision and Dr. Ted Fay in Massachusetts, um, again, you know, providing some examples from the, the US ski background that he has as far as that integration and inclusion goes. And so I think they're all kind of comments reflecting and referring to some of the, the comments Sherry 
um, and Wayne that, that you made, but I want to I want to jump to the question again. We've got about 15 minutes left, so by all means, people feel free to add questions and comments into our chat function. I want to go to the question from Doug, um, Doug Garner. So he reads, "Thank you all for your insight and experience. What impact do you think the growing discussion of diversity, equity, and inclusion will have on Paralympic sport and programs? More opportunities and more respect for medical treatment doctors and athletic uh, trainers. What's I mean, this is, this is a global discussion that we're having. It's certainly not uh, precluded to the United States or North America. Um, where do these issues and questions and comments as it relates to diversity, um, equity, and inclusion have an impact on sport medicine, and in particular in the Paralympic context? I'll open that up to any of the three. Sherry? Uh, yeah, I, I can first <laughs> Good one, Sherry. Okay. Sure, you will answer that one for us. I'd say that, yeah. Well, a couple things. I think that um, as we see the elevation of discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, we're also, um, that discussion, of course, reaches sports medicine as well, as it should. And um, and when we think about, I think, I think that it elevates us and our movement because um, as, when we think about um, equity from a few different equity in a few different ways in which it intersects with sport medicine, I think that the disability community and elite Paralympic athletes on the whole will likely benefit from that. Um, I think about it primarily under two pillars. The first is thinking about equity as it relates to access to sport, of course, and physical activity for health. Um, we, you know, of course, a lot of emphasis right now in ensuring that as we develop physical community-based physical activity programs that were equitable in terms of who they reach and who has opportunities. There's still a lot more work to do in that space. Um, I know that, for example, here in the U.S., um, you know, socioeconomic status is, uh, you know, has a great deal of influence on whether someone has access to physical activity and sport, especially when they're young. And um, you know that that's unfortunate, right? <laughs> there should be equitable access because we know it's important for health. We know it's important for you know developmental growth into adolescence and adulthood, and we need to do more. Um, we always have to be very uh, diligent and outspoken regarding ensuring that disability is is uh, integrated into that conversation because when we talk about diversity, disability is often forgotten. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we have to you know, continue to be a squeaky wheel on that topic. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And then I'd say the other is um, equity as it relates to how we provide care. Um, you know, there are some, not a lot, but some studies that show, for example, that um, that your, you know, whether or not you're offered ACL reconstruction after you tear your ACL may have something to do with your race or again, your socioeconomic status and there are disparities there. So that's a problem, and um, we need to continue to, um, you know, look at that in a data-driven way. Um, I don't think that that anyone really has looked at it as it relates to disability, um, but there's probably something there that um, that we shouldn't forget about or, or not pay attention to. So I think, and that all goes back to bias. So I think there are still elements of bias that impact. Um, the care that para athletes receive, and of course, you know, here we're, we're, we are the informed, right? Those of us on this Zoom, <laughs> we are our own choir, so we probably don't have that problem. I mean, maybe, but um, not as much. But I think when you look broadly across the sports medicine sector across our country and certainly across the world, that bias still is probably a problem in terms of um, how athletes with disabilities access care. Thank you, Sherry. I, Grey's Anatomy just profiled that exact issue last week on their episode, which is how I learn all about medicine. Um, if you're watching this. <laughs> um, David, can I, can I, I, I maybe so chip in there a little bit? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, I mean, it's a, that is such a good question and uh, it prompted me to really think about how, how I'm going to answer that. And I, I, I think uh, that sitting here at the tip of Africa, I'm well primed to answer that. And um, I think, you know, if I look at our own uh, National Olympic and Paralympic uh, committees, yeah, you know, and the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion in South Africa, and indeed in the whole of Africa and in the global South generally, with the exclusion of a couple of uh, continents, is a huge issue. Uh, Paralympic sport, if you haven't got money, 
is a major problem. It is a major problem. And uh, we have got athletes who just simply do not have access to the bare minimum. And I'm reminded by, uh, of a colleague, uh, Leslie Schwartz, who is known to many of you on this panel. And Leslie says, how can you talk about Paralympic sport when your issues are to do with the three T's? And the three T's are time, taxis, and toilets, because those are your priorities. And if you've got a disability, your basic stuff you've got to actually worry about are time, taxis, and toilets in South Africa. And Parasport actually comes way down the line. So I think it's actually a good to bring this to this discussion here. And one can get very insular in North America and actually miss the big picture of what's happening there in the rest of the world. And, yeah. it, uh, you know, we have greatly talented athletes and they can't find proper racing chairs. They can't find equipment. They don't have access to the correct blades. And this is a country, South Africa is relatively wealthy in the greater African nations. So, you know, let's put that, let's just think about that context for a moment. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And also just to, just to dovetail on that and remembering that again, as, as Wayne introduced in terms of his career path in sport medicine, like, you know, movement and access to sport and physical activity is part of our job. So it's mm. not like, <clears throat> you know, so a, a continent of people not having access to spare sport is a health problem. Um, so uh, absolutely. Let's go back to sport medicine. If yeah. I may, there's another way to look at diversity. I agree with everything that's been said, certainly, but it's uh, not particular or specific to parasport medicine, but sport medicine in general, certainly in this country, I'm guessing I'm uh, similar in South Africa, Sports medicine providers, including physicians and physiotherapists and athletic trainers in this country are uh, primarily white and uh, some fellowship programs, sports medicine fellowship training programs, including ours, are making strong efforts. And there's increasing discussion on the national level to train more uh, minority sports medicine physicians who can serve as role models for the athletes. Um, they are underrepresented. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, so I saw the comment uh, from Eric, and, and Eric, we'll come back to that if we have time, and I'm sorry for doing this, but it, uh, Eli, I wanted to pass it over to you because I know when we talked originally that there was the one kind of big question that we wanted to get to towards the end. So Eli, can I pass it over to you to ask the question? For sure, yeah. So definitely some great questions coming in, so we can turn to those shortly. And, we have one of, and you've touched on it already a little bit with the kind of the global impact and WHO and kind of how inclusion in sport really has these additional outcomes and what that means for society and diversity and inclusion. Um, but I guess a sort of a more current question I wanted to touch on just to start this conversation is the, the current reality we're in now with COVID and leading up to Tokyo and, and kind of where we're at. And so I guess from a sports medicine perspective and all that's happening now in our world, um, perhaps you could just share with us some thoughts on that. Like, how are things with COVID, the reality we're in, what, what, what's gonna stay the same, what's gonna change? You know, what do we need to be thinking about? Um, so perhaps just to, to kind of make sure we don't ignore that question just because it's the current reality we're in today. Stuart? Just briefly, you don't have to go long on it. Just a short, short yeah. response is fine. There, there are many issues. COVID uh, is hard on everybody. It's hard on young people. It's hard on old people. It's hard on uh, laborers. It's hard on healthcare providers. Uh, in this country and others, uh, minority communities are particularly hard affected. What I hear from elite athletes is that one challenge is that it's hard for them to stay motivated when they really don't know when their next competition is going to be. Elite athletes are regimented in their training routines. They want to know what they're doing on Monday, what they're doing on Tuesday, Wednesday, so forth. And they don't know, and that's very unsettling to them. Then there are the additional concerns about traveling internationally uh, during the pandemic. That's weighing on athletes and coaches and trainers. 
And then, of course, they have the usual concerns. How is their mom doing? How is their grandma doing during this? And on top of that, on the uh, medical side, some athletes who have had COVID, whether they had symptoms or not, are now uh, showing uh, cardiac, delayed cardiac manifestations of that. So we're doing cardiac workups on every single athlete who's had COVID. And unfortunately, there are way too many of them. And uh, most of the workups are negative, but a few have come up alarmingly positive in terms of 12 lead ECG, uh, echocardiogram, uh, cardiac MRI, and, and it's a big problem. So that's weighing on athletes. My suspicion is that um, once uh, vaccines roll out worldwide over the next six plus months, we'll be in much better shape. We will eventually return to normal. I am very, very hopeful about 2021 being a much better year than 2020. In uh, the United States, most parts, and particularly, and certainly where we are in the Mountain West, the three month uh, outlook is dire. Uh, but after that, things are looking much more hopeful. Uh, so I think things will eventually return to normal. I worry there will be a lot athletes, including elite athletes, who will have uh, long-term uh, manif manifestations of COVID in one way or another, just like is existing in the general population. So hopefully that's a small percentage. Yeah, agreed. Hopefully they all get better with time. Yeah. We don't know yet. Terry or Wayne, do you want to add any comments to that? My, my contribution to that is uh, obviously, you know, one's, one's concerned about what's going to happen next year, uh, how, how the Paralympic Games are going to look, and how the Paralympic Games are going to look in, in the following year in Beijing for the Winter Games. Yeah. And um, I think what, what I want to say is that it might, it, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes uh, to try and ensure that the games that are going to occur are going to be fantastic and they are going to be as safe as possible and that the planning that is going on is um, it takes into account many different scenarios and i think it would be safe to say that we are going to enjoy a games that are going to be spectacular they're going to be a bit different to what we're all used to how that's going to look is uh, going to be interesting um for example uh crowds might not be like the full stadium that we are used to uh at some paralympic games um there might be alternatives to cheering or shouting loudly but there are going to be answers to all of those questions that are going to make it, I still think, a very wonderful experience and certainly something that I'm looking forward to. And I think that, I mean, the, the, the advent of the, 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 the rollout of the vaccine is going to be very, very interesting. Who's going to get the vaccine first? Are athletes going to be prioritized? Are athletes with disabilities going to be prioritized? Um, how is it going to be, we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how is that going to look all around the world? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be yeah. the rollout of vaccines predominated by the rich nations? I don't know, I don't know. But these are the kind of discussions that are being held at the moment uh, at the highest level. Sherry? Thank you, Wayne. Sherry, any final comments? We only have a few minutes left, and Dr. Sedward, I do want to give you a chance to say a few, a, a few quick closing words. So, Sherry? Yeah, any? no, I don't have, I don't, nothing, nothing significant to add. To, I think Stuart and Wayne hit the nail on the head. Um, I just say that I think that, you know, there was one point that was touched upon very briefly, I think, by Stuart, which is just to say that we don't, we don't yet know um, of all the people who are being affected by COVID right now, you know, what are the long-term sequela and what, what may be the disability related to that in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I just think that's an interesting thing as we, you know, we think about again, that blend of rehabilitation and into sport and what that means for our movement, you know, there may be maybe something that um, would be a, an area of opportunity and development and another avenue to serve 
our country and world moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Sedward, can I turn it over to you for a few quick summary thoughts? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. And, you know, the most important thing I, I want to say and, you know, in, in my closing remarks is, is just how much, again, I enjoyed uh, b being part of the discussions today with Doctors Blauet and and uh, Derman and Willick. It was uh, it was really truly an honor and a pleasure for me to to listen to their comments and, and I can I can see in my mind as I look past my 53 years of involvement in the Paralympic movement where it was where it is now and 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 where it is going particularly from the sport medicine point of view. I mean we. We didn't get around to talking about uh, uh, drugs in, in the Paralympics. We didn't get around to some of the research, I think, that uh, Wayne was talking about. Uh, there is a very limited amount, and I know as much as we tried when we, when we first created Vista 93 back in 1993 here in Jasper in the mountains uh, west of Edmonton, that it was uh, the research element that was really drastically missing. And, and while there were investigations going on, uh, we did, I think, the first study on boosting and uh, uh, dysreflexia, you know, and wheelchair design and, and uh, designing of hockey sledges and all of those kinds of research topics are so vitally important. And, and while we have so few in comparison doctors involved in sport medicine, within our Paralympic movement, you can see the vast opportunity, but where do we start? And, and how, who is going to lead the, the, the whole medical aspects from the, greatest, from the greatest global aspect? I mean, I'm still concerned even to this very day, and Wayne, I think you made the, the point. There are still many, many, most of the countries are the have-nots. There's very, very few countries that have. Uh, and even those that have, it's very, very little. So while we have come from being a mere fledgling caught within the superstructure of international sport, we have grown in both uh, quality and in quantity to become one of the largest sporting nations in the world or sporting organizations in the world, which we're all very proud of. Uh, but we do have a long way to go, but I'm just so unbelievably happy that we're in such good hands when we, when we see uh, Sherry and Stuart and Wayne and all the others that are just like them that we have globally helping us with our, our sport medicine area. Mm -hmm. So thank you to all three of you very, very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you um, in both uh, Japan and China in, in the next coming years, even though I'm getting so very old, I'm not sure whether I should be traveling even if in normal circumstances. But anyway, thank you to the three of you. That was most delightful and, and I was, uh, I couldn't be more, I couldn't be more pleased. Thank you, Dr. Sedder. You have to keep going because you have to keep taking me as your assistant. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. You might have to be carrying me the next time. <laughs> I, know we're, I know we're a few minutes over. Just a, a few couple comments on behalf of myself, Eli, Ted, Faye, and Mary, who we help coordinate these, these talks. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for our speakers. Our next one, we're going to take a little bit of a break over the holidays, is going to be with Andrew Parsons, president of the IPC, on January the 28th. So stay tuned for that. This will, has been recorded and will be uh, available on the IFAPA website, the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity. So Sherry, Stuart, and Wayne, you will be trending uh, by tomorrow on YouTube, and you can tell all your friends that you're a YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> happy holidays. Well, thank everybody. you all so much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks for including me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.